She worked for, with Ruja Bakshi, who was a speaker in this seminar series a few weeks ago. Um, Kitty is actually a very well-known expert in human-robot interaction, which is uh, a big thing these days, you know, since robots are apparently everywhere, flying all over the campus, trip, letting us trip all over them. Um, and Kitty is interested in maybe making them, you know, not drive right in front of us, seeing how that they can, how a robot can actually cooperate with people, or expect, or plan around people, and actually be human-centered, autonomous. So let's all thank her for coming and giving us what I'm sure is going to be a very interesting talk. All right. Well, thank you. That was a very nice introduction. Let's see if I can uh, live up to it. Yeah, so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of uh, what I've been up to um, in sort of building these uh, autonomous systems and hopefully making sure that these are systems that we can actually interact with and trust. Um, so at a very high level, uh, my lab tries to answer this question. So how can we ensure safety in these data-driven autonomous systems that have to operate out in the real world and with uh, people? So to answer this question, we typically look at human behaviors. So a lot of what I do is look at new ways to model uh, human decision-making, um, how to predict how humans will move around. Um, and we rely on tools from learning and optimization so we can build up these decision-making systems and really rely on this foundation in control so we can actually implement these systems and make sure that they uh, work in practice. Um, one thing that I am uh, very active in is making sure that we can take all of the tools that we develop and the models that we use and make sure we connect them to some real world system. Um, so I consider myself an experimentalist. So basically everything that we try and do, we want to actually put it on a fairly realistic system so we can actually uh, make sure that these things work. So this is really important when you're dealing with humans and autonomous systems interacting because you actually need to do something that's realizable so you can actually capture that human element uh, very well. And so hopefully by building these new tools and testing um, in good experimental test beds, we can actually release these out into the public and again, make sure that everything that we um, are designing for uh, actually happens when they're released uh, into the wild. Um, and as was said, I work on this idea of human-centered autonomy. And so autonomy is this sort of very broad um, area, and I've been very fortunate that I've been able to work on many sort of different uh, levels and different sort of subcategories of it. So most of my work while I was here as a grad student at Berkeley, and I was working on this um, area of semi-autonomous systems, so really looking at how we can model and predict those human driving behaviors, um, and design test beds so we can actually gather this data, and again, make sure these things work. Um, and again, this um, is basically looking at just how people drive and thinking about how we can model these single agents. Um, we can take this one step out and also look at how we can design both autonomous systems that are safe, um, given some human interaction, but also take into account these human models and sort of look at this coupling and this cooperative behaviors. Um, then we also look at sort of this extension of these uh, different sort of multi-agent systems and think about how different um, types of agents and different sort of uh, modes of interacting are sort of captured by these models. And making sure that we have decision-making systems and autonomous stacks that can take into account all the different mod modalities that might occur. So as I said, I've been very fortunate that, we'll start, that I've been able to work on a pretty wide spectrum of these uh, different areas. So to give a little bit of a background of what I think of when I think of autonomous systems, um, most people think about autonomous vehicles when they think of autonomy. Um, and as you know, there's been a lot of hype around this. A lot of people are in this area now. Um, but hopefully, uh, since this is a transportation seminar, you all also know that this isn't a particularly new idea. So there have been uh, examples of autonomy going all the way back to the 80s and 90s. So one of the key projects was this Eureka Prometheus project where they were able to drive across highways in Europe. Um, there was also cases of CMU driving across America in the 90s. So uh, even though there's a lot of sort of new fun things and there's a lot of attention right now, it's important to note that uh, perhaps the ideas aren't particularly new. But there are some things that are sort of different now. So we're entering this sort of new era where cars are sensing more and more. So we have these new sensors that can quickly gather a lot of data about our environment. Um, and arguably more important, we have the computational power that can now handle and compute on these sort of massive streams of data that are coming in. 
Um, there's also sort of new modes that are arising. So there's lots of communication abilities. Um, so there's new things like B2B, which are becoming an actual reality and something that you know our cars are not going to be able to actually use. Um, but probably the most important thing um, is that there's a societal, well, a societal push. So the people are more or less ready. There's a lot of excitement. So there's sort of this big push uh, just to develop autonomous systems um, and put them into the hands of the public. OK, so for those of you who are paying close attention, uh, you might notice a few things that are a little bit odd about this slide. <laughs> so um, a few things. Uh, let's see. So this quote up here is from 2015. <laughs> <laughs> this is from the Obama administration. And if anyone recognizes this picture, I probably should have credited it, but this is from Google back in 2014. Um, so <coughs> this slide was actually made for my quals presentation uh, in 2015 while I was here at Berkeley. Um, so one big question is, uh, why can I still use this slide? Or why is what I'm saying here still relevant, even though it's been almost five years? Ooh. So um, let's maybe take a step back to when I was starting my PhD and look at sort of where we were in terms of autonomous vehicles in sort of the news and popular culture. So this is when uh, Google was first sort of coming out with their car. Um, and they started making some big promises. Like within five years, um, everyone would have an autonomous vehicle. Um, and again, so this is in 2012. Uh, we were also seeing a lot of um, sort of interesting statistics, like the Google self-driving cars safer and better at driving than most people. So, and it wasn't just Google, right? This was, most car companies were starting to make these pretty big promises, and we're kind of thinking about um, uh, well, how they could be better than people, and about this sort of release coming in about five years. So, again, this was in 2012. So if we then fast forward to a few years ago, 2017, um, we started seeing articles that were more like this. So after the peak of hype, Self-driving cars enter the trough of disillusionment. Uh, the hype of self-driving cars come crashing down in 2018. Uh, self-driving cars are tapping the brakes. And even though there's more attention, so this was highlighting the fact that CES, this big electronic show, had tons and tons of sort of things showing off a new driverless technology, um, there was still sort of no payoff to be found. Um, and probably this one's probably the most important one is um, many companies started pulling back a lot of their sort of planned releases um, because they couldn't actually show that these systems were safe. So they thought the technology was ready, but they couldn't really provide that guarantee, and they didn't really know how to know when the testing was good enough. So this is um, a quote from GM, but there were lots of examples of this. So Volvo was doing this. Um, I think Google had some things with the taxis. Um, so there's lots of examples of basically things that we had to start pulling back and why things weren't ready. So the big question is what, uh, what is missing? And what are sort of these pieces that uh, we haven't been able to unlock after these years, uh, all these years of basically a lot of attention going towards this development of autonomous systems? So one of the things I argue is that it's this human component. So even though we see a lot of demonstrations, um, if we look at how people drive, um, we might be a little bit surprised and see sort of where something's missing. So this is a video of just people driving um, in an unstructured intersection. Um, and just sort of see. So even though there's lots of cool demos of autonomous cars doing things, there's nothing that can really capture sort of this uh, sort of unstructured interaction where people are just sort of guessing and moving and seamlessly moving around each other. So more or less. Um, so again, this is a fairly cherry-picked example. So this is sort of the extreme end of how people drive and how people interact. But I think it sort of represents a lot of interesting things that we're sort of missing. So when we're designing our autonomous systems, we really want to make sure that both we can handle these sort of crazy scenarios, because they do exist, um, but also see what we can do to learn from drivers. So how can we capture some of this intuition and this behavior to actually uh, you know, make our autonomous systems better? Um, and again, cherry picked example, but I think uh, another thing to note is that most autonomous systems out today are actually not as safe as we previously thought. So if we were to put our autonomous system in difficult scenarios, we might find that these uh, our collision rates are actually higher than most um, uh, human drivers, your average driver. So to get a better idea about this release or this integration of autonomous systems, um, let's take a quick peek at 
um, sort of how autonomy has evolved in the aerospace industry. So the aerospace industry has actually been dealing with this introduction of autonomy for much longer than the vehicle domain. Um, so, so let's sort of look at these trends over time. So this is one of my, my favorite plots, but uh, here we have a fatalities per departures um, on the y-axis, and this is time. So this is years from the release um, of commercial planes to the 2000s. So if we look at all aircraft over time, we see this nice sort of decaying trend. So this is good because this basically means we're getting safer and safer over time. But if we break this down into different generations, we'll see something very surprising. So the first generation follows sort of a similar trend, but for each subsequent generation, we see this sort of peaking phenomenon. So in this tail end, so as we sort of reach this steady state, which is also sort of interesting, we are getting safer. So this is sort of lowering as we get uh, more and more advanced technology. Uh, so we are getting better. But when we first introduce see this sort of spike. And there's sort of two important things to note here. So first, when we release this technology, it's actually more dangerous than the previous version. So we do see this sort of um, higher point. Um, and there's also this sort of decay factor. So it takes some sort of settling in time or some burn in time before we actually reach this settled point and sort of these transient sort of decay away. So this is sort of an interesting phenomenon. And again, this is in the aerospace industry where we do have trained pilots that are working with and interacting with these new systems. Um, and they're actually trained, and each system is certified. And so it's supposed to be safe, but there's something that happens in this interaction that causes this sort of increase in risk. What yeah. defines third and fourth generation? Like, what defines the beginning of a generation? Ah, so uh, let me move to the next slide. Uh, so here's the real data, so you don't think I'm lying to you guys. The other <laughs> one was pretty. But so here's um, the other. Uh, so the second generation was, I think, just a new sort of type. Um, some of these things were just different navigation displays, so they weren't even sort of significant changes to the hardware. Um, and this one was the flight envelope as well. And this is from uh, Airbus. <laughs> okay, so uh, again, when I first started working in this area um, as a grad student here, uh, we really started thinking about this coupling or this interaction between humans and automation. And if you look at this, we looked very closely at how people uh, were driving. Uh, so we started looking at basically how to capture these driver behaviors. So we started working with this uh, big simulator, which I don't know if it is still around, but if it is, it's in McLaughlin basement, I think. Um, so this was uh, basically the system that let us collect a bunch of driver data and start building up these models to start understanding how we can predict uh, these human agents and understand how they'll interact um, with different agents. I will note that this is actually a race car game, so this is a little more exciting than most uh, data we collected, but it's a good visual. Um, so uh, this basically allowed us to collect fairly realistic data and sort of let us come up with um, a fairly good idea of how we might um, start building up these models and uh, predicting how people drive. So we looked at a lot of different driver modeling uh, applications. So again, one of the first things we were looking at is this idea of shared control in this semi-autonomous space. So we started thinking about how we could basically predict how people would behave under different modes or levels of attention. Uh, we use these same models to then think about how we can design autonomous systems um, that can interact or use these predictions as constraints in their planning. Um, and then we were even able to do things like prove some nice properties. Um, and given that we had this sort of full simulator in our lab, we could do some cool things like put fun sensors on them and collect data and sort of predict things using uh, biosensors and sort of new age um, or new novel sensing modalities. So uh, since this was most of the work I did at Berkeley, I'm not going to talk about that um, today. Um, but one of the things I want to note was we could take these um, predictions and incorporate these into our autonomous uh, vehicles. So what we can do is we can take these those are robust prediction models and start incorporating this into planning. And so today, what most of what we'll be talking about is how we can design these autonomous systems so we can actually trust that they will interact with us smoothly and um, hopefully safely um, in sort of real world um, test settings. So today we're gonna to talk about uh, three sort of um, quick things. So the first uh, thing we'll talk about is some of our work uh, in just coming up with these autonomous planners. Um, and looking at sort of decision making in these um, urban environments. Uh, then we'll move on to validation. 
So how do we actually test these systems that have to operate in these highly stochastic environments? Um, and then if there's time, we'll touch on some sort of newer stuff um, that we've been playing around with, with vehicles and pedestrians interacting in sort of a more free-form fashion. Okay, so again, we'll start with this sort of autonomous uh, work. And this is with the project I was working on during my postdoc. So this is what I was doing while I was at Stanford, and I was sponsored by SAIC. So this was a very fun project uh, because we basically got to uh, play around a lot with um, trying to come up with different uh, decision-making and control strategies for autonomous uh, urban driving. And one of the big goals of this was to try a bunch of different techniques and basically evaluate the pros and cons of different methods. So we did everything from very uh, traditional model-based approaches to the more uh, maybe flashy neural network type things. So we got to play around with a lot of different things and sort of see where these different components and different approaches sort of fit in and came into play. So we sat down and we started thinking about what we need to do. Something they don't really tell you about is most of autonomous driving is uh, sitting thinking about why things aren't working. Um, but we basically got to build up our whole pipeline. Um, so we started with uh, different control techniques. So we started with, again, very uh, traditional uh, model-based approaches like model-based control. We also played around with um, some learning-based control. Uh, we came up with different decision-making techniques, um, specifically looking at safety and robustness. Uh, in this, uh, we thought a lot about different behavior predictions or how we could really operate well in these urban environments. So again, these are basically these components uh, are really important when we're in these sort of urban settings and we have to think about how um, how the different agents are going to come into play um, in this more freeform setting. Given this whole pipeline, we wanted to think about how we could actually validate the system. So again, given some sort of system that we want to test, how can we come up with some measure or quantity of safety or see sort of where the system uh, will fail? And finally, we want to do the full integration. So again, connect this to our perception and localization and make sure that this thing will run in fairly realistic uh, driving Okay, so again, we basically implemented and tested this whole uh, pipeline, and we were testing at Gomentum Station. So Gomentum Station is a test facility that's actually out in Concord. Um, it's nice being in a crowd that might actually know where that is. Um, so a few hours east from here, or two hours maybe in traffic. Uh, but this is basically a closed down Air Force Base that let us basically test or create a testing sort of ring is where we can recreate sort of our own traffic. It's basically an abandoned city. So it was a great test field for us to basically do this freeform uh, urban driving setting. And our end goal or end deliverable is to basically continuously drive around this loop, um, interacting with other cars, obeying different things like traffic um, signs and signals. And yeah, so this worked. Now I could show you videos um, of this working, but to be honest, it's boring. Uh, good driving is not very fun. So let's actually look at cases where we needed interventions. So let's look at these failure cases and see what we can learn from them. So first we have this case where we are driving down our road. Uh, we're going to make a decision to overtake this vehicle in a second. So let's see where we are going. At some point we start deviating. And then we're just gonna kind of start careening straight towards this vehicle and our driver intervenes. So one of the big questions is, why would we have a car that does that? <laughs> so actually the big failure here um, was due to model mismatch. So we started looking at different things like uh, reinforcement learning. So we were training a lot in simulation and because the simulator that we were working with did not exactly match the constraints of our real vehicle, uh, basically this car thought it could get behind this car in time when it actually could not. So this is sort of a big common problem, is making sure that this gap between simulation and the real world is as close as possible. We're coming up with new techniques to basically overcome this model mismatch or this distribution shift that occurs. Another big problem that we had is actually just dealing with tough uh, perception problems. So most of us were more on the decision-making and control side of things. So when we started getting inputs like this, and we had lots of flashing detection boxes, which might be a little bit hard to see, um, we kind of ended up in this sort of steady state where we couldn't be confident of what we were doing. Yes? So, how did you set up your RL 
So in this section here, so for this we designed a reward function that will basically optimize this line changing and efficiency um, there. The, uh, the constraints were actually from the model itself. So because we were working in a simulated model, the dynamics themselves were fairly different. So it was basically a system identification problem for this vehicle here. And if you want this precise reward function, I can point you to the paper where it's explicitly written out though. What simulator did you use? So in this, we were using a uh, in-house built simulator. Um, it's available on GitHub called Automotive Driving Models. Um, but what we did do is we basically fit this model or this vehicle as much as we could uh, and basically did this. So this was written in Julia, so it could run pretty fast. Yes? So this was by trial and error. So when we started playing with the constraints that were on the actual hardware of the car, where we put basically our limits on like turning rates and things like that, the problem sort of went away. So again, it's basically by intuition of playing around. Yes? Um, what was the human component again? So this part, so these are all human driven vehicles. Oh, the other vehicles. Yeah, so that was the human component. But otherwise, not too much at this point. Yes? So we do, so this RL is basically learning the control policy that is controlling a vehicle which has dynamics and simulation. But the problem is in this real world, this is also basically issuing commands to a vehicle that has slightly different dynamics than what's here. Um, and these different dynamics introduce different constraints and how you can move through the space. And so these are the different constraints um, that we're working with. Okay, okay. So, so you just, so you assume that the dynamics for the simulation, I assume the dynamics are like something of like a, a, an equation, but then mm -hmm. you move the physical system to kind of like bridge that gap. So you're not learning the dynamics. Correct, correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, and what we're going to be talking about is how we take into account this model mismatch um, in a moment. But yes. So in these examples, not totally, but in some other cases, yes. So, yes. And um, there's a whole other sort of wealth of problems in how do you trust a prediction or not, which we won't talk about today, but it's super interesting and I'd love to talk to you about it after. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so again, um, so we have some problems here which I claim are by model mismatch. And we also had just some problems in dealing with um, this interplay between perception and decision making. So it's often very difficult to even just model your perception failures. And taking into this, uh, this into account in decision making is typically a very hard problem and a lot of people are working on this sort of in a research um, setting. So another um, problem we typically, uh, or we often ran into is when we were first um, trying out uh, different control policies, especially with these learning-based uh, methods. Uh, we could take things like behavior pointing, um, and here we're just trying to learn a weaving policy. So here we have some spooked obstacles, so there's cones in the real world, but we're spooking our senses to think there are obstacles. We're going to weave through them. And one of the things that we found, which maybe shouldn't be too surprising, is that if you use sort of naive neural network approaches, you kind of have these cascading and instabilities and as you run for long enough, you start getting this control that is not very good <laughs> and tends to be fun to be a passenger in. Um, but so uh, there are often failures that are just caused by these inherent instabilities or sometimes referred to as cascading errors in these uh, deep neural network policies. So in this specific example, when again, we were playing with this weaving approach, uh, one thing we tried to do was basically learn from humans better. Um, so we took an approach where uh, basically what we wanted to do was improve the data collection process. So we looked at uh, new ways to do interactive um, imitation learning. So we can come up with basically new techniques to uh, basically collect data and come up with that better, more stable policies. And again, this is sort of a data fixing problem. And another thing that's sort of fun with this project is we can also quantify um, our uncertainty here. 
So by using um, some fun approaches, we could actually quantify the variance, know how confident we were in a certain sort of prediction estimate, and then decide whether or not we should actually let our neural network control. So here we have this example where we have a low variance. We know what's going on. At some point, we encounter a scenario we don't know how to handle. We pass things back to the human. So this um, is basically just a quick uh, visual of one approach that we took that basically helped us sort of fix the data problem. But it didn't really solve any of the fundamental problems um, that we sort of mentioned earlier, where you have this sort of problem with just sort of fundamental instabilities and some problems with this data mismatch. So one of the things we wanted to try and do was look at how we can take decision making or RL policies and try and make them more robust um, for this application in driving. So uh, we decided to try to formalize this a little bit so we can take a fairly uh, standard equation and think about how we can take and make this more robust. So following sort of standard techniques, we can write out our dynamical system. So we have some input of the vehicle that we're trying to control, so this will be our U, and we can have some unmodeled error or some disturbances that will capture basically what isn't included in our model. And if we try and come up with basically a robust decision maker, it should take into account these constraints or these mismatches um, inherently. So hopefully we won't have this just trial and error and sort of find where these cases happen on their own. Um, and again, this is not a new formulation or a new problem. This is often used uh, to take many things into account, like uncertainty in your sensor noise um, and environment. And this is um, often solved using sort of these traditional robust control techniques. But there's also sort of these new problems that are working on these more higher dimensional challenging problems. So you can think, um, again, specifically at these um, ideas of model mismatch, where we have this real vehicle with things that we haven't directly modeled or are trying our best, but might not be capturing precisely, in a simulated world where we're actually doing this training and collecting, uh, building our policy up. Uh, there's also a lot of uncertainty in this interaction. So because modeling people is often very challenging, we can't assume that we can capture this exactly in our simulated world. So we have to take into account some of these sort of interaction problems um, into our decision making uh, directly. So again, uh, we now take this and we're going to ask two problems. So one, how do we design policies to be robust to disturbances like this? So in this, we're going to look at different adversarial reinforcement learning techniques to see if we can improve our control of a vehicle. And second, we're going to look at the cases where the system will fail. And this will actually lead into our next section where we talk a little bit about validation and think about where um, or how things like interaction can sort of throw off our system. Okay, so we're first going to look at this just decision-making piece. And this is more or less going to just account for things like model mismatch um, in our simulation and some noise um, from the environment directly. So again, we're going to be taking this uh, reinforcement learning approach. So if we were taking a traditional uh, RL approach, we would try and maximize our expected reward given some transition model T. So again, we have some environment. This is going to be governed by some transition model. And this is basically what we're going to try and optimize when we're solving for our optimal policy. Okay? But again, this is sort of assuming we can, we might not know our model explicitly, but we do have something that we can query. So we do have a simulated version of this environment. So one thing that you do, um, if you don't know your exact uh, model or you want to sort of add some robustness, you can start extending this um, to many different possible transitions. So you can start thinking of basically sampling over many different environments and many different sort of uh, instantiations and possible models. And you can start now learning a expected uh, reward over a series of different uh, transitions. And uh, while this uh, often works very well and is tied to things like domain randomization, typically you have to have some sort of domain expertise or some knowledge in the sort of source distribution, and it tends to be not very data efficient. So you basically have to really sort of expand how much you're querying and searching your space. So in contrast to the sort of traditional method, again, where you're now looking over a bunch of different environments and possible models, um, you can also look at this adversarial approach where instead of trying to model your expected reward, or look at sort of this average case, you now explicitly want to look uh, at this conditional value at risk. So what this is going to do is now look at basically how to model these worst quantile cases. And the argument is if you can sort of look at your tail events, if you look at these worst cases, 
you should be able to be more robust uh, in execution. So you're not over generalizing to this sort of expected or average case, but instead you're specifically looking at sort of these uh, risky um, cases. Um, and this is a nice way to look at things, but this is often very hard to actually uh, capture in practice. So there's a few different ways that you can start thinking about this. So one, you can do things like uh, passive sampling. So if you sample a bunch of uh, trajectories and you start thinking about actually the statistics of these samples, you can actually now find some of these uh, worst quantile uh, trajectories. So basically by sampling a bunch, you can try and build up this model and try and capture this. Uh, one other approach is to take a more active or adaptive sampling approach, and that's using these adversarial uh, methods, which again have been gaining a fair amount of popularity uh, in the learning community. So instead of directly uh, trying to capture this risk measure, we're going to basically look at this adversarial setting, where we're basically trying to find basically what are these riskiest scenarios, and how can we sort of tune uh, this quartile uh, risk. So to do this, we're going to follow uh, what is common in the adversary RL, um, adversarial RL literature, where again, we have this sort of formulation. So we have this system that we're trying to control, and we have some um, disturbances that will basically try uh, to perturb this system. We formulate this as a two-player game here. So we have our system that we're trying to control. This will be our protagonist, or some player one, which is trying to maximize our reward. And we have our adversary, which again is trying to maximize the opposite. So this is formulated as a zero-sum game. So we can ignore this um, component for just one second. So again, uh, this is just sort of an approximation of how we can come up with this robust decision-making method. And what we're going to do is we're going to basically uh, start thinking this as an iterative game where we solve for the optimal policy for our protagonist, freeze this policy, and then come up with the policy for our adversary. So by iterating back and forth, we have this iterative best response, and we can try and see where this will get us. And this is sort of the common approach in this adversarial literature. Um, one of the big problems with this, though, um, is actually designing these adversaries and these rewards is typically very difficult. And because we are sort of stuck with this iterative best response formulation, we typically uh, fall or have sort of two problems. So the first one is our adversary becomes too strong, and very early on, we basically cannot overcome some of these issues. So controlling basically the way this uh, adversary is represented or what this disturbance or forms these disturbances can take will basically lead us to this case where we're not ever able to learn or produce a good policy. So we basically have this over-aggressive disturbance. This is basically saying we have an over-aggressive uh, or an over-conservative policy. Uh, we also have this setting where we're basically just iterating back and forth. So we never actually converge to a meaningful policy because we are always switching back and forth to the best response of our uh, adversary and the best response of our protagonist. So we actually don't come into something actually meaningful. So one of the things we did was we looked not just at a zero-sum game, but we started adding some incentive for the uh, adversary not to be sort of too aggressive. So we started penalizing this when it became basically too strong um, of a penalty and wasn't capturing real source distribution errors. So when we found that this, uh, we basically added a discrete penalty when we were not modeling something that would actually occur um, in real, the real world. Yes? So I guess the first, this, this problem would come up because it's not actually a symmetric game, right? Mm -hmm. Like player two, I would guess, would have a much easier time finding a solution to make a car crash, right? Exactly, exactly. Um, and that's part of the problem that if you just were to do this like pure zero sum approach, unless you're sort of adding just ad hoc constraints, it's not easy to just sort of throw this at the problem and solve it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, but by adding this cooperative turn and no longer doing this pure um, competitive game, so when we move to this sort of semi cooperative setting, um, we find that we have um, significantly improved um, results. So here's a plot. So here we're looking at failure rate. So we're looking at basically how frequently we get into a collision. And this is going to be our average reward. So what we want is this to be zero, and we want basically a very high average reward. And what we find is that if you look at um, the zero sum approaches, or even just different types of solution methods, uh, we tend to get things that actually fail a lot. So 
Um, and these are when uh, these little different markers show when we're sort of perturbing different uh, model parameters. So this is all in simulation. Um, so we can basically tweak different things like axle length. We can change how quickly the car can turn. So we can kind of have a controlled setting to actually test things like failure rate that we can't do on the car. So uh, by doing this, we see that we tend to get very high failure rates. But using this uh, our approach, we get this much tighter result here, where we're able to maintain fairly high uh, reward and reduce the failure rate significantly. And another thing we found was that when we actually went to put this on the vehicle, we had a much smoother time translating it from the simulated world to, uh, to the real world because we were just uh, explicitly taking into account this uncertainty um, in our decision-making policy. Okay, so again, we were looking at these sort of different cases, specifically looking at some uncertainty in our uh, setup as well as this model uh, mismatch, match, mismatch case. Um, but this didn't actually model some things like other vehicle interaction well. So uh, one thing we wanted to do is come up with a way so we can see uh, where different agents interacting with us would cause uh, these failures. And this is what led us um, to our next uh, topic, which is on validation, which I think, given the time, would be my last topic. So let's go kind of fast, because uh, I have some fun videos. Okay. So I showed some failures before, and we were in this sort of testing development stage, so we were bound to run into some failures, but we were actually fairly lucky, because one phenomenon with vehicles is that failures are actually very low risk. So if we focus on just these last two um, items, so this is the failure rates or collision rates of people driving. So people are actually very good at driving. So even if we drive a lot, it's very unlikely that we'll actually find a collision case or an example of this. Um, so uh, this is a problem that basically means we can't just test our vehicles in the real world and get meaningful samples or a realistic sort of statistic out. So to overcome this, often what people do is they turn to simulation. So again, they can simulate lots of different things. We can use um, these nice simulators and try and basically find failures so we can debug quickly there which we've already talked about can be a problem because we don't have that great of simulators that can actually model all these different things like interaction. Um, but this is typically what people do. But even in the case of simulation, we'll often find that we are sort of overgeneralized to expected cases. So again, uh, or here's an example of just some policy where we're trying to just see if we can go through the intersection. If we were to just run this policy for hours and hours and hours, we might never actually find a collision because we're not actually explicitly looking for these failures. So what we want to try and do is explicitly search our simulation space so we can find some failure examples. Um, and they might be trivial, um, or they might actually be meaningful. But just finding these cases is a hard problem even in simulation. So uh, we'll skip through some of these things, but let's just say that it is typically a very hard problem so one of the big problems is if you were to just try and define everything you wanted to search over, you'd have this combinatorial explosion. It would be very difficult to actually find something, and it's not obvious what of these different trajectories or possibilities is actually meaningful. And what you really want to do is find an efficient searching method that can just find something like a failure um, in this sort of interactive settings. So what we've been doing is defining or developing this tool called adaptive stress testing, which will help us do exactly this. So how do we find these uh, failures efficiently? So to do this, uh, we've looked at uh, basically formalizing this uh, validation problem as a sequential decision-making problem, where we now are querying and controlling our simulator um, using an RL solver. So what's nice about this is we can use tools from RL to help us basically explore and efficiently search our failure space. And we're going to do this basically by defining a our reward function intelligently, so we can find basically the most likely failure. And so what's nice about this is this is a nice sort of transparent thing that will guide our search. And if you hand this off to someone with domain expertise, they can easily tune this and actually help them sort of guide and find the failures that are of most interest to them. So by defining this um, and defining some interfaces, we can quickly search um, this space and hopefully find out failures. Um, another important thing to note is, um, in general, this is a very generic formulation, but based on what our solver is, will give us sort of different insights. So you can use the Varel 
um, solvers here. You can handle very search, uh, very large spaces or complex simulations. Um, you can also make this something like a Monte Carlo tree search, which gives you lots of insight and some structure to basically what you're searching through and what states you're actually exploring. So typically we use MCTS to actually find these different failures and we can do some sort of fun things that way. Yes? So for this, if you want some system under test, it can be a system that's controlled by RL, it can be a system that is controlled by the intelligent driver model, it's just some system that you're trying to query. Um, and how much transparency you have into the simulator is um, something that you can kind of tune. So we have some examples, and examples will show already do have transparency here. Um, you can also do things where you actually have a very black box approach, um, and you just look at things like um, <coughs> controlling a random seed. But we won't talk about that specifically. Okay, so uh, anyway, so we have this basically search function, so we can control our simulation and try and find these cases uh, where we fail. <coughs> so let's look at a little bit of an example. So again, this is assuming we have a fairly white box approach. We have some vehicle that is approaching a crosswalk, and maybe we have some pedestrians which are trying to uh, cross the street. Again, since we're looking at things like uh, interaction here, we'll actually be controlling our participant dynamics. So these uh, pedestrians are going to become some controllable agents so we can try and find failures when we are interacting with uh, these pedestrians. So um, this, um, vehicle itself is actually going to be run, as I hinted at before, just with an intelligent driver model. Um, that's basically been modified, so if there is some uh, obstacle detected in its field of view, it will come to a stop. So if we look at a very typical simulation, we'll see something like this. So this pedestrian is walking out, and our car comes to a nice stop. So one thing that's important to note is this is sort of an average or a typical um, simulation. And if we are controlling our pedestrian and doing a worst case analysis, so again, maybe not an intelligent search, but just a worst case, we will find something that's like this. So we will have our car and a pedestrian that just runs directly <laughs> into the vehicle. When we have a, this like, totally free agent that we can do almost anything, these failures are not interesting. <laughs> well, maybe they're fun, but not interesting for designing our car. So one of the big questions that we try and ask is how do we find a relevant failure? And again, this comes down to how we're searching our space. So in this case, we find um, we have some detection noise. We can't actually track and detect our pedestrian correctly. And so as it edges to the um, edge of the road, we actually do find a collision. Um, and we do this through iterative uh, reward augmentation. So let's see if this will play. So here's another example of one that we found, where we kind of have this some sort of dance back and forth. <laughs> and then just something happens. <laughs> so let's look at this from a top-down view, which might give us a little bit more um, insight. So um, this is a slightly more complex setting where we have two um, pedestrians, but we want to watch this top one, where these agents are kind of doing this dance. There's something not right here, and we end up actually colliding. So again, this is the same failure, just with more agents. So one thing that's interesting to note here is, it, it's a funny example, but it actually does tell us something about how our prediction is doing. So clearly we weren't understanding the intent of this agent. There's something wrong in basically this higher level decision problem. Uh, another thing we can do is um, through this um, iterative reward augmentation, we can start addressing some sort of more fundamental problems with using RL search, uh, RL solvers as a search technique. So one problem is we tend to sort of converge on one optimal failure, one optimal policy, but really we want to find many different failures. So, um, by doing some intelligent augmentation, we can then find some other cases of failure. So in this case, even though we have these pedestrians, which again are very easy to find failures, then we can actually find some other cases, like where this car, for whatever reason, has some sensor failure and runs into our vehicle. So again, the, these examples are kind of cute, but this is actually a very difficult problem. Um, and this is actually something that, again, is a little bit silly, but I'm fairly proud of, because this is something that's actually been translated to industry and is now sort of being integrated into people's pipelines. Okay, so to save some time for questions and whatnot, I will skip over some of these other things and just end on my roadmap. Let me do a quick thanks to all the people that actually did the work for most of this. Mm -hmm.
And so thanks to all the people that made this happen. Um, again, this is not just me, this is a huge effort. So thanks to all of them. And with that, I will take a few questions in this last few minutes. Several, uh, several of the failures in your uh, failure case examples that uh, you said were caused by sensor noise are. Mm -hmm. So, is that how much freedom do you give, like you know, the adversary or whatever, in like you know, screwing up the sensors? Do you have changing mm -hmm. sensor noise or like how? And, and is there no freedom, like to correct for sensor noise? Or I guess I'm curious about like you know, how meaningful is the sensor noise example and like. Uh -huh. How can you, what can you learn, like how do you improve your sensor robust, et cetera? Yeah, yeah, so this is actually a very tough question. So um, what we often try and do is measure something like perception errors and try and match these. But one thing that's fairly typical or difficult is when we were working with our industry sponsors, uh, we were often using their perception systems um, and they could not actually give us a good like, error model. So it's actually very hard to quantify this in practice. You can say on test sets I have 99% accuracy, but it's not exactly obvious how to characterize that in a meaningful way and in a simulation. Um, so it's sort of a tough uh, problem, um, even just from a implementation thing. So, but what we tried to do is come up with some reasonable model, capture some of our errors, and make sure we're not deviating from that too much. So we usually say, this is something like a Gaussian distribution, hopefully it's some meaningful. Is there ever a case where having less sensors was actually better since more sensors uh, raise the risk of like there being just like an outlier somewhere causing damage? Uh, so usually we were operating on a sort of a output um, or something that would come from a perception system. So we were often operating on like uh, detection boxes and things like this. So dealing with sort of many different sensor modalities, uh, that we didn't really touch. Um, so I can't give a good answer that's not just speculation, but if you have good sensor fusion, it should help. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes? So in that scenario generation, can you comment on how you augment your reward function? So for example, you don't get that one interest to the cards when you observe it, how you augment now the reward to the other two. I see, so there's two ways um, you can control this, and um, it sort of depends on how much uh, insight you have to your simulator. So if you have um, the ability to control the models of the different agents, you can sort of limit how much they can deviate from like a expected model. So you can't just improve the model of these agents, so you won't have uh, a totally irrational pedestrian that is sort of suicidal. You can sort of guide it to be more reasonable and sort of follow a more typical model. Um, so you basically are only adding a little bit of noise or some uncertainty. So if you have a lot of control over that, you can sort of fix it through that regard. Um, what we were doing with the reward augmentation is we were encouraging basically finding many different solutions by adding this dissimilarity metric between found failures. So we're basically iteratively changing our reward function to basically bump away or discourage a failure that we've already found or something that's relatively similar to it. So this is sort of how we encourage this diversity in catalog or failures. <coughs> What's the metric that defines difference, differentness from failure cases? So in this case, we were looking at the output trajectories. So again, we did have to have some insight to what our simulator was doing. We basically looked at comparing these trajectories, which is sometimes difficult because they had different time lengths, but this is basically what we tried to do. Um, and there's lots of trajectories, similarity metrics that we basically incorporated in. Yeah. Yes? Um, so yeah, you talked about um, trustworthy automation, right? Mm -hmm. And you talked about that um, it's difficult for you to model um, the human behavior. Mm -hmm. And so, um, when I watched this video that you showed from the pedestrian like, um, mm -hmm. just standing there and the car running into him, then as a psychologist, for me, the interesting question is, so will, it will be very hard for us to predict um, autonomous vehicle mm -hmm. behavior. And is there something that you're working on of capability to give an output of the mm -hmm. decision that you are making in the car? Like the, okay, go on now to, to show it to the people on the outside 
then you could maybe also prevent for some of these accidents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think this is, there's tons of super interesting questions here when you think of just the perception of how people perceive autonomous vehicles. So um, one thing that I think is uh, interesting is so for you seeing these failures, uh, it might seriously impact your trust. So I think there's some really interesting questions into just how much, uh, how much should you know about how your system can fail? So I think that's sort of an interesting problem, but that's not what you asked. Um, so there are lots of people working on different ways to signal um, basically what's going to happen. So people are looking at things like lights or some sort of indicators um, to basically help communicate to people. Um, one of the things that's a little bit tricky is you do have to have some sort of training or it has to be really intuitive. Um, and the best way to make something intuitive is to try and capture something like the nuanced motions that just people have. Um, so I think this is an aspect that I have worked on where you try and recreate how people typically do things. And that actually has been shown to um, increase acceptance and predictability. So people are able to predict the intent of an agent much better just by giving some sort of nuanced motions that people uh, also do. So that was a long-winded answer. Uh, I don't know if that actually answered your question. <laughs> but yeah, lots of interesting questions there. OK, so with that, uh... Let's all thank Dr. Driggs Campbell again for presenting you on behalf of ITS Berkeley. Thank you. All right. Thanks again.